if you interpret an event in a negative way, you're going to experience negative consequences. But the more mindful you are, the more alternative understandings there are. To be stressed, you need two things, Joseph. You need to believe that something is going to happen and believe that when it happens, it's gonna be awful. So um, a very simple solution, um, easy to say, possibly not as easy to do, but is first, I've seen people online that describe your way of thinking and coming up with experiments as unconventional um, in a good sense, of course. So I would love to know what was kind of the process that you used to come up with theories and hypotheses? I don't know that I have a particular um, uh, way of doing this. What happens is somebody says something and I think of several different ways that may be true or not true. And then that naturally leads to a different view from the one most people are taking. You know, so for example, um, I noticed way back in uh, way back in 2019 that it seemed the people I knew who were smokers were not getting COVID. So I asked all of my students to see five, 10 people, as many as they could come up with. Um, who had COVID and find out how many of them were smokers. And um, it turned out that none of the smokers had gotten COVID, but there are lots of problems with work like that. So then I went online, turned out somebody else um, had the same idea and I left it to them so I didn't have to learn about the biology that would be involved. Um, but recently there was an article in The Economist that indeed smokers are less likely to get COVID. So the point is that we have something smoking, which typically is considered bad. And my natural response is, well, what ways is it good? Not, not mm. um, denying the ways it may be problematic. Right. So it's almost always when there's something that seems one way, I naturally, for reasons I can't explain, uh, tend to turn it around. And then this is very useful with respect to um, judgments we have of people. So um, um, you call me lazy and I say, no, I'm not lazy. I'm insufficiently motivated. Um, I call you inconsistent and you say, no, you're not inconsistent, you're flexible. And you do this often enough, then you naturally uh, look for alternatives. And that's the essence of being mindful, recognizing that anything we understand can be understood in many different ways. And each of those ways give rise to a different way we behave in the situation. Um, what you were describing there, that seems to me like uh, heterodox thinking, critical thinking, really analyzing the other side. Have you always been like that from a, a young age? Yeah, um, but I, it, all, it was all one side that what would happen is people would tell me something negative and since I was and always a happy camper, I would then <laughs> find a way of turning around and telling them positive, you know, giving them the positive view. Um, I don't think that growing up, uh, anybody would tell me something positive and I would say, yeah, but, you know, and show them the other side of it. Fantastic. So. Yeah, well, I, I was going to say it's good that it did go that way as opposed to, to the opposite. Um, one thing I would kind of love to ask you, because one of the things I guess in your CV, in your life, that you must be immensely proud, is that you were the first uh, female tenured professor of psychology at Harvard. What I can imagine that there must have been many, many women academics in psychology at Harvard. Why do you think that you were the person to get that over perhaps other academics? Oh, I don't know. That's a loaded question. What am I to say, you know, how I was different from these other people, you know, that in part, it could have been the time was right. Um, I don't know that while I, um, when I was a student or um, early on as a young faculty person, I don't think I saw myself uh, gendered, you know, mm -hmm. so I just uh, behaved uh, in the way that the people who seemed to be doing it um, admirably 
did. So um, uh, I don't know. I think maybe uh, part of it might have been that my interests were broad so that at, um, you know, the Harvard would have these social lunches for social psychology and psychopathology lunches for the psycho uh, psychopathology track and cognitive lunch. And I found it all interesting. And so I went to all of them. And so probably um, made friends with that, that being my initial intention. Um, it's, it's hard to say at any moment, you know, it's hard to know why you've succeeded or failed. And um, I think uh, you want to resist the temptation that you succeeded because you're better than everybody else. More important, when it doesn't work your way, you don't want to assume that you were uh, less than anybody else. People make their decisions based on lots of different things. Um, so anyway, a sweet question, and I'm sorry I can't answer it. I like it, and, and I really like the answer. And one of the reasons is because on this show, we interview a lot of people that um, I've kind of come from, a, a, that have achieved great things in their lives. And that's one of the things that I'm always interested in. Why does one person succeed and one person doesn't? And you mentioned clearly that you're a very open-minded person. And one of the things throughout your research career is that you have, I guess, gained the title of the mother of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. So I would love to kind of take the the this interview there. And let's start there because this is a kind of a great, I guess, place to kind of delve into your research work. What would you say is the difference between mindfulness and mindlessness? When you're mindless, you're more or less acting like a robot. The past is determining your present behavior. You're insensitive, uh, unaware of the way context and perspective affect you. Your rule and routine governed. You know, you're sort of doing what um, at an earlier time you thought you should be doing, thinking, and so on, taking things at face value. When you're mindful, you're actively noticing new things. Um, in actively noticing new things, you see that perspective and context matter. You're um, sensitive to context and perspective. So you're aware that certain things that are true in one context are not necessarily true in another. Uh, your behavior is not random. Uh, you can still have rules and routines, but they tend to govern what, uh, guide what you're doing rather than determine what you're doing. Um, I think also the main difference is that as you're actively noticing, you're engaged. And so the neurons are firing and it's literally and figuratively enlivening. Once one realizes how easy it is to be mindful and all of the advantages to being mindless, it's unlikely that they'd ever go back. Uh, the problem is that our cultures, yours and here in the States, Virtually everything is teaching us to be mindless, to hold things still, to think we know. So when I lecture on this, I, I often begin by asking a simple question. So Joseph, I'll ask you, how much is one in one? Two. Okay, and most people say that and think that I'm crazy for asking the question, but one in one isn't always two. If you were to add one watt of chewing gum plus one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. Add one cloud plus one cloud, one plus one is one. Add one pile of laundry plus one pile of laundry, one plus one is one. So, wow, look at that. The thing we think we know the best that we're absolutely sure of um, is also context dependent. Actually, you know, most people aren't aware there are different number systems, but in a base 10 number system, if you were just doing abstract math, one plus one is two. But if you were using a base two number system, one plus one is written as 10. All right, and so, so it is with virtually all our facts that they're true sometimes and not at other times. And when we're mindless, we accept them as true and we don't pay any attention. Um, we just assume that we know. And it's that assumption that gets us into all sorts of trouble. So when you do this often enough, you come to see you don't know anything. And, and that's a good thing, you know, that since everything is changing, everything looks different from different perspectives, you can't really know. And so um, if you were to 
accept the inherent uncertainty in everything, the not knowing, then you'd approach everything as if you're approaching it for the first time and it would be exciting. And the reason we don't do that is because our schools, our parents, everything out there is teaching us that there are all of these facts. And as if the facts are context-free, they're absolutes. So if you knew what I was going to say next, why would you listen to me, right? And that's the way most of us end up living our lives as sort of painting by numbers. Uh, where everything is predetermined and nicely organized. And, you know, so we confuse these mindsets we have with the underlying phenomenon. We're holding it still. It's varying, but we're holding it still with our minds. And we do this, I think, to feel some control. You know, if I can make believe all of this is uh, nice and orderly, um, then I, I know how to respond to it. And that very process of holding it still, since it's not staying still, uh, robs us of the control that we seek. And in a state of mindlessness, do yes. you think that this is where people get in a state of saying, time is just going by so fast, there's not enough time in the day? Because I hear people say that all the time. As I get older, time seems to fly by. Is that possible? Um, well, um, people mean different things by it, you know, that if you're really enjoying yourself and being mindful, time does seem to fly by. If by that you mean, oh my gosh, I have to write this report or um, study for this exam or do this, this thing that I don't want to do, and oh my gosh, there's no time left, uh, that's uh, sort of seeped in all sorts of mindlessness you know, the mindlessness that uh, you can't get it done in the amount of time left, that it's crucial to get it done in the first place, you know, that if you don't get it done, the world's going to, your world is going to explode. And um, so e each aspect of that needs to be unpacked. Because one of the, the things that I was thinking about was I do the same drive to work every day. And sometimes I've driven to work and I'll be an hour into my day and I'll think, I can't even remember my drive to work because I've done it so exactly. many times. Exactly. A complete state yeah. of mindlessness. And so what happens is um, uh, people are aware of becoming mindless in that way. You know, we've all, not all, but many of us, we drive on a highway and we're supposed to get off at, let's say, exit 16. And all of a sudden you're at exit 22. You know, where was <laughs> um, What I find most interesting is the mindlessness that comes about on initial exposure to information. So somebody just tells you something and you buy it, uh, take it as true, and then you never think about it again. And then you get trapped by the implications of that information. So for example, and people don't do this, this example is less true now than in the past, but in the past, if you were told, let's say cancer is a killer, so you just accept cancer is a killer. Why fight it? You don't have cancer. You don't think you're ever going to get killer, uh, get cancer. So you accept the mindset. Now, let's say five years later, uh, you're diagnosed with cancer. And what happens is too many people give up because of earlier uh, accepting the, the faith that cancer is a killer. Sure. You know, so what happens is uh, we're given information. Once we accept it as true, we're trapped by it. Um, and um, that's a shame. You know, so for me, um, I had this, this experience that, I, I don't know, I've said this so many times that I assume it's true, but I, I can't be absolutely sure, but it's a good story at any rate. The, the fact of it is true. I don't know if the effect on me was as dramatic as it sounds, but I'm at this horse event. And this man asked me if uh, I'd watch his horse for him because he was going to get his horse a hot dog. Now I'm Yale educated, Harvard, Yale, all the way through an A plus student. I'm just, you know, nobody knows better than I as well, but not better. Horses don't eat me. He comes back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And it was at that point, this is the part I'm not sure is an apocryphal, but at that point, everything changed for me. You know, what do you mean horses may eat meat? It's like, what do you mean one and one may not be two? And so when you recognize 
that um, uh, all the information you're given could be wrong, then everything becomes potentially interesting again. You know, and this wouldn't be likely to happen, but you're, you know, you're someplace, there's no people around for miles and miles and miles, and you're on horseback and uh, you're getting hungry and your horse is hungry, but there's nothing there to feed him and all you have is a hot dog. You know, you wouldn't think to give the horse a hot dog, right? And so the horse dies and the story is terribly sad. So I'll stop writing it at that point. Um, <laughs> but these, these mindsets that we have um, um, keep us from being happy, keep us from being healthy. And all the while we're oblivious to the fact that if only we hadn't accept this truth as absolute, um, life would have been different. Sure, and I would I would love to kind of delve into mindsets um, with you in a bit, just to kind of, I guess, go back to mindfulness. If kind of what I'm taking uh, from you is that by, I guess, staying open to new possibilities that perhaps horses do eat meat by kind of keeping this, uh, I guess, beginner's mindset in some way, seeing mm -hmm. the yes. novelty in life, this could be a way for us to cultivate more mindfulness in yeah. our everyday lives. Yes, exactly. What, yeah. what would be some other ways that we could cultivate mindfulness? Well, um, the first is to accept that everything is uncertain. So if you deeply appreciate that uh, we can't know anything for sure, then you naturally stay alert. You know, if you were going to come visit me right now, I'm in Cambridge. Have you ever been to Cambridge? Uh, only the one in, in England. Not okay, the one in so the you've United never States, been I'm here. Never been so here. And you're going to come visit me. It's your first time here. You don't have to train yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to naturally look around and see, you know, all the new sites. Um, so uh, by recognizing you don't know that everything is new, then you're naturally going to be mindful that when you're at play, you're being mindful. And there's a way to approach almost everything uh, as if it's a game, not, not a lack of seriousness, but still that it can be done so that it's enjoyable. So whenever you're enjoying yourself, you're being mindful. So then you ask yourself, how can I take this thing that I don't like and make it likable for me? You very famously uh, did research into the illusion of control. So I guess perhaps I could just ask you about that research before I get into more specific questions that I have. Okay, well, um, at that time, because now my beliefs are very different, but way back, I did this work when I was, this is my thesis when I was at Yale. And um, I was then in some ways as mindless as so many others looking down at people, you know, if you go to Las Vegas and you see people talking to slot machines and, you know, and so on um, and seeing people do things where you know it can't be done. Okay, so why do people do that? And so in other words, if there are situations that are chance determined, why is it that people think that, um, that they can control them, that their subjective probability, probability of success is greater than the so-called objective probability would warrant. So I tested this by taking elements that, things that are important in skill situations that are irrelevant in chance situations, and we put the skill situation in chance situations. For example, uh, this was well before any place in the world was giving choice of lottery tickets. Choice matters, you know, if you're uh, going bowling, it matters which bowling ball you choose. And so it's not too heavy or too light or whatever, which tennis racket, baseball bat, and so on. Which lottery ticket you choose is irrelevant. But since choice is always associated with things that are controllable, when we give you control over a lottery ticket, now you actually feel you're more likely to win the lottery. Um, if we had you practice flipping a coin, you know, uh, practice is relevant. We'll go back to sport, you know, that the more tennis you play for most people, the better you're going to be, but not so uh, flipping a coin. You know, for most of us, you just keep 
keep flipping, you're not getting any better. But because practice usually leads to improvement. Okay, so you get the general idea. The importance of these studies was that they were the very earliest um, studies in priming, um, where you know there's some element that's not related that then leads you to behave in ways that you otherwise wouldn't. Um, now, the reason I said that, that's the way I saw it before. The way I see it now is uh, people's behavior makes sense or else they wouldn't do it. When we say that you can't control it, uh, um, therein lies the, the problem. Let's take a roulette wheel. Mm. So somebody thinks they can control the game of roulette. You know, should I pick 32, 26, red, you know, black, whatever. Uh, the implication by the person who's saying you're being irrational by thinking you can control it, is that this is a game of chance where each number, each color is equally likely. Now, if we examine that, it's to my mind very unlikely that each number is equally likely. For to be equally likely, when we make the wheel that we're gonna spin, it has to be perfectly balanced. Yeah. Right now, we put it on a truck to deliver it to the casino. Each wheel on the truck, each tire, has to be equally balanced, or else you know it's going to um, have an effect on the balance of the wheel. And so, when you go through this, it becomes clear that it's unlikely that any number is. The, but the point of it is that. Um, it would take so long to find the bias that we're going to act as if uh, each number is equally likely. Now, the point of that is that when we recognize that it's not likely to be equally balanced, the person who's trying to figure it out is not as irrational as when we start by saying, you know, there's no way you can control this. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. That, okay. Um, so um, right now, I no longer see it. People don't have illusions of control. People believe they can control it. Now, if I think I can control it, whatever the it is, and you don't think I can control it, you assume I have an illusion. Hmm. Okay. Um, but everything is the same until it's not. And somebody uh, uh, is able to produce something, do something that nobody thought was possible, right? You know, you go back 20 years, could you have imagined an iPhone? Okay, so that if I was spending my time trying to develop this thing, you would think that, you know, it was delusional or that I had an illusion of control being able to produce something that uh, one can't come can't produce. Why would that be adaptive? Why would that, what? Why would it be adaptive? Why have we evolved to, to do that? Well, um, because I think that we can't know what we can or can't control. And, you know, so you can assume you can control it. You can assume you can control it. Let's say for argument's sake, it could turn out that you could control it or that you couldn't control it. The worst possible case of those four cells for me is when you believe you can't control it. And in fact, you could. Yes. Okay. And so by believing that we can have this effect as the, uh, I think the reason for innovation, uh, for new ideas, and by attempting to control something, uh, you're uh, engaged, you're being mindful, uh, you're happy, and if ultimately it doesn't work out, you know, so be it. So to believe you can control it doesn't mean you have to stay with it, you know. So let's say um, there's no reason in the world for well, um, for me to believe that I should get a Nobel Prize in physics. I'm not a physicist, right? But um, I think that it would be wrong of me to believe. I couldn't get a Nobel Prize in physics. How do we know? So now I go teach myself physics and I struggle with it and I enjoy it and I come up with new ideas and so on. Um, but I'm so far from that goal of getting the Nobel Prize 
I now say, now I'm going to go back to psychology. What what is still to me feels very different from saying I can't do this or that, in this case, get the Nobel Prize in physics. We can never know that we can't. I think that's a major mistake and has very big health implications. All you can know is that what you've tried hasn't worked. Mm. That's very different from saying that it's uncontrollable. Science can never prove that anything is uncontrollable. All science can show us, again, is what you've tried uh, didn't have the intended consequence. So. Are the, so, so if I'm understanding this, that I guess having a, a healthy degree, uh, a belief that you have a certain amount of control over uh, your that destiny. You may or may not be able to control something. Yeah, right. And then, then it's whether you have the desire um, to bring about a certain outcome, to try to control it. You know, so as with physics, the my Nobel Prize in physics, uh, I believe that I could get a Nobel Prize. In, there's no reason why I should believe that, but there's also no reason why I shouldn't believe it. All right, that doesn't mean I have to, you know, go down any particular path. If I believe I can't do this or that, um, then I don't engage the activity. And then we have many things where um, I could, in fact, have brought about the outcome I wanted. What do you think about the whole fake it till you make it kind of idea? Yeah, um, I think that stated like that, it sounds awful, right? <laughs> you know, because it sounds like you're trying to deceive people. Yeah. So I'm not suggesting faking it. I am suggesting that try to make it until you make it. You know, and um, the trying, again, if somebody else thinks it's futile, they'll say you have an illusion of control, um, but they can't prove that you can't do it. Now you continue it. If you're enjoying what you're doing, keep doing it. Um, if you decide there's something else you'd rather do, then you change, but you can never know that you couldn't, that I couldn't have gotten. I mean, you know, I have to stop saying this because I'm going to decide I want a Nobel Prize in physics and I'm too busy with psychology to engage it. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> but I, I'd be really interested to kind of ask you about this because going through um, kind of the uh, research that you've published and, for instance, many of the famous studies that, that people can see out there, you've highlighted uh, over and over again, the power that, uh, I guess, mindset can have not only over psychology, also over biology. Of course, that'll be a conversation for another podcast in the future, hopefully. But I would kind of love to ask you um, just in terms about that mindset. Uh, so, for instance, if I just pose a question to you, and I wonder if you tell me what you think about this. Um, perhaps if you took two groups and you told perhaps one group that, for instance, I'll just give an example, something like stress, and you said to them stress was inherently bad. Then you took another group and you told them that there are all these adaptive benefits to, to stress, that it will drive you towards increased performance. Do you think that the first, sorry, the second group would perform better, that our minds oh, can do it? Sure, sure. There's a um, um, very extensive literature going back in the 60s on um, misattribution studies. But, you know, so um, something happens and you have to understand it. And the way you understand it will determine what you do about it, right? So in the simplest way, if I fail a test and I say it's uh, because I didn't sleep, well, next test I have, I sleep more, um, you know, the night before. If I say it's because I'm stupid, my chances are I'm not gonna be able to become less stupid by the time of the next step, so I don't study. All right, so the attribution we make makes a very big difference. Now, um, we make attributions for uh, implicitly for all sorts of um, behaviors, feelings, you know, so that if um, um, I'm nervous, um, you know, before doing something and somebody tells me that that's excess of um, energy, Mm. that I can use to achieve whatever the goal is, 
So now I've got it and I use it and, you know, and engage the goal. And in that engagement, I'm, you know, mindfulness is energy begetting. So now that I'm not scared, uh, the more I do it, the more energized I become. If I uh, see that um, feeling that I have and I say, oh my goodness, that means I'm scared um, and I'm going to fail. And then I go down that road, no, um, it becomes again, a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the things that people don't seem to realize is that they have choices uh, regarding their emotions. You know, to have an emotion, as Schachter and Singer explained, <clears throat> this is me also in the 60s, <clears throat> you need two things. You need that physiological and you need um, a label for it. And so let's say uh, you're going out on this, uh, your first date and you're wild about this person. Um, and now you get that feeling. Now, if you call yourself um, anxious, the date might not go very well, but you're not gonna stand tall. You're not gonna seem confident and be happy and whatever. If you said you were excited about the date, you know, now you can't wait to get there. And you're going to process all that happens subsequently through a very uh, positive lens. So being anxious or excited are basically the same thing. But the attribution you make, calling it one or the other, um, uh, goes a great distance in how successful you'll be. And the more mindful you are, the more aware you are of the different ways you can label these feelings, uh, these physiological reactions. And so um, then if you can come up with a label that's motivating or one that's you know, exhausting or going to lead you to feel helpless, most people are going to choose the motivating label. But with respect to stress, you know, it's interesting. I know lots of people now talk about positive stress. And that, that's crazy making for me. That's like positive rape. You know, uh, <laughs> why not come up with another word for it? You know, yeah. stress is negative. So when you're feeling uh, this excitement, that's positive. It's, it's not stress any longer. Um, you know, that apparently some people need to feel a little scared before they'll engage in activity. Um, I, I don't know that you have to be, you know, that you just start thinking about it and it will become again, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in a positive way. But stress, uh, now that you asked, which you didn't, but I'm going to assume Please. you're thinking that, you know, <laughs> what is the relationship between mindfulness and stress? So stress is not a function of events. Events are not good, not bad, they're nothing. It depends on how we interpret them. And um, so to ask yourself, how do you know it's gonna happen? Give yourself three reasons it might not happen. So you went from thinking it's definitely gonna happen to now maybe it will, maybe it won't. Right. Then the fun part. Now let's pretend it's going to happen. How might that be a good thing? Because the important part of, um, of our experience that mindlessness keeps from us um, is that events are not good nor bad. Events are events. It's our understanding of them that makes them good or bad. So if you take this thing that may or may not occur now, and you say, how would this be a, a wonderful thing? Then you go from, oh my God, this terrible thing's gonna happen to maybe this thing will happen, maybe it won't, but if it happens, look at the advantages. I mean, and we studied that, uh, I did a hospital study, preoperative stress study back in the seventies, where we, we taught people to think this way. So, you know, so the doctor tells you, Gee, I'm you know, in the hospital, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to delay the surgery, so you're gonna have to be here another four days. And how do you feel? Well, you know, oh my God, that's more time away from my business and you know, so on and so forth, more time worrying about whether the surgery is gonna be successful hmm. or it could be mindful. What are the advantages of being in the hospital? Ah, I'm in the hospital now, I don't have to deal with all those emails and all of those um, commitments that I've made, everybody will understand. And, you know, I have a television in here and there's supposed to be so many good things on Netflix and whatever, so I can enjoy that. And to me, I tend to 
to eat too much, but here my diet is being controlled, so I may actually lose. You know, you can go. I would go on and on. This is wonderful. That's like checking into a spa, right? <laughs> but um, you know, so to show you that things are not good or bad. So now, because I've had this extra time in the hospital, I develop a new philosophy of life. Wow, is this wonderful that I've been in the hospital? However, you come to see me. And you're part of my old philosophy of life. So you don't know what I'm talking about. Our relationship is, you know, is going nowhere. And so that's depressing. But then I get out of the hospital and I meet new people who are part of this new philosophy. And so the point is we see things as positive or negative and as if that's the way they will always be. And they change over time as you get older, you know, something that was negative when you were younger and now is an advantage. But at any moment, there are ways of looking at that consequence and seeing it as good, bad, or indifferent. When you recognize the control you have over how you see events, um, then, um, you know, stress becomes something you rarely, if ever, experience. I, I love that point. It reminds me of that quote, I think it's something like things are not good or bad. It's thinking that makes them. It makes so, them stop. Correct. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. And I was thinking, as you were saying, about some of the things in my life that I perceived at the time to be the worst things in the world. And then usually you think this this was a blessing. You know, there was tremendous yeah. benefits to it. Yeah. So even COVID, you know, so you have lots of people um, who uh, uh, had to stay at home, have their pods or whatever you know, not seeing many people and Zooming all day long. And for many people, wow, you know, I'm glad I'm not in the office, you know, and they, they finally come to terms with some of the things that have been awful for them. Uh, every day, you know, seven to five days a week, eight hours a day, putting themselves in situations that don't work for them. And now they get a chance to say, maybe I don't want to do that anymore. And so the, the time out because of COVID, which has led to what is it called the great uh, migration, oh, yeah. uh, the great uh, resignation, yeah. the great resignation um, speaks to that, but something that was seemingly negative. Or as I said before with that earlier thing, which is very surprising it was to me, uh, will be to most people that people who smoke are less likely to get COVID. I mean, you start off believing you have good things and you have bad things. Mm -hmm. And the good things, you have to step over everybody, do all that you can, race to get it. And the bad things, you have to, you know, spend all this time making sure it doesn't happen to you. Losing sleep at night to make sure it doesn't happen. Then when you come to the, the um, calmer place of seeing that, that thing that you're racing to get um, has some bad parts to it. If I want to see it that way, I can be happy without it. And that thing that I, I fear so much has another side to it. Then you can just be still and, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, so we have this interview. It's nice to get to know you. Uh, so I'm enjoying myself. If all of a sudden the internet went out, you know, that would be okay. I'd go have lunch. That would be nice too. You know, that... Um, it's a, um, it, it just gives you a great deal of control over um, how you're going to experience your life. If I could, I would just kind of love to go back to a point that you were making earlier that I was thinking about where you were kind of describing, um, for instance, someone before a date and they were kind of the words that they would use before um, could kind of, in some ways, determine, predetermine right. how that date might go. So in that instance, do you think that the language that we use could have a great deal of impact essentially on oh, the reality? There's no, oh, there's no question. Um, people um, are oblivious to how virtually um, most of what is being sold to them, told to them, has already, um, uh, the words have determined exactly how they're going, going to experience it. Um, I, use, I did a study a long time ago, one of the early studies on mindlessness, showing the importance of the word because. That's just one word because. So we had people who are about to use a copying machine 
And um, if you ask the person, excuse me, can I go uh, ahead of you because I have to make copies? Well, it's empty, right? What else are you gonna do with a copying machine except make copies? But when you said because, you gave a reason, then people let you do it. And it's not really, you know, and some people weren't thinking about what the reason was. It just meant that you respected them. It was a way of showing respect by giving, uh, by giving a reason. Something I realized the other day, and we're collecting some data, not, you know, enormously important, but still fun. Um, I have a friend who would say something and she'd say, but, and I would say, and. <laughs> that if she switches the but to an and, it's much nicer. You know, but means the first part um, is irrelevant. You know, you're very sweet, but. Um, yeah. uh, and so, you know, making that little change, recognizing that almost anything you're describing could be described with other words. One, the thing that I'm most um, uh, excited about um, sharing is that people's behavior makes sense from their perspective or else they wouldn't do it. So you take every time you're calling somebody by some negative name or yourself uh, describing it in some negative way, there's an equally potent, strong, oppositely valenced alternative. So Joseph, you can't stand me because I'm so gullible. That's because I'm trusting. Mm -hmm. I have trouble with you because you're so inconsistent. That's because you're flexible. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't I'm be bothered with myself because I'm so lazy. That's because I'm insufficiently motivated. That as soon as you change the word describing the exact same behavior, everything changes. Mm -hmm. You say, you call me lazy. When I tell you it's because I'm insufficiently motivated, now it's your fault for not motivating me uh, rather than my fault. Um, so yeah, language, language is very important. Language gives us a lens through which to interpret all of the ambiguous information around. And um, there, you know, again, the more mindful, the more of these different lenses you'll use. So if I said to you, uh, do you want to meet my friend Susan? She's um, uh, very impulsive. Why would you want to meet her? I said, do you want to meet my friend Susan? She's very spontaneous. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Okay, so once we see that things can be described in, in many different ways, again, um, you know, all sorts of choice opens up to you, right? Because now, you know, when I say, do you want to meet Susan? You know, she's um, very impulsive. You say, oh, that means she's spontaneous. Sure, let me meet her. I was really interested today to kind of talk to you, I guess, perhaps about harnessing the power of mindfulness and the mind. And we've kind of gone through, I feel, some really, really great points. And I'm really excited to, to get this out. Um, I'd love to, we always ask our um, our guest a question from our Instagram audience um, when we, we mentioned that you were coming on. And I guess this kind of relates to this point, but I wonder kind of what your thoughts are. Um, someone said, what do you think about quote unquote, the law of attraction and kind of <laughs> affirmations? Um, you know, uh, I never read that book, um, but the, the summary that I was given is that if you think it can happen, you make it happen. And um, at that level, I agree with it. I think that certainly if you don't think it'll happen, it won't happen because you're not paying attention how to make it happen. Right, just as I said with my Nobel Prize in physics, that if I assume I can't do it, then I'm definitely not going to be able to do it. If I assume that I can do it, then I start to apply myself and then we see in what direction it goes. Um, so I think that the main point, and again, guessing what the law of attraction is, that um, you filter the world, you, you can't see everything all at once. And so the particular filters you use will determine what you see. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to see you as spontaneous, 
uh, then I'm going to interpret lots of your behavior very differently from if I see you as impulsive. Regard, you know, because impulsive is bad. So who's, what's the kind of person who's impulsive? He's not caring. Uh, he's not somebody I'd want to go out with, so on and so forth. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So by using this, this more positive lens, uh, then I'm going to um, see lots of your behavior in a very positive light, which then will increase the chance that we have whatever relationship we were you know, hoping to have. So it's not, people often act as if what, you know, especially interpersonally, but even beyond that, that everything is already fixed. You know, so if a student of mine uh, can't, um, is having trouble finishing the paper on time, um, that if they think that this decision that it's due on Tuesday is etched in stone, they're not going to ask me, mm -hmm. right? And that's the way we respond to most things. If the student realizes that, well, virtually everything that is was at one point a decision. Sure. And as a decision means there was some uncertainty. So given that there was some uncertainty, maybe they could ask me if they could turn it in late. And, <clears throat> you know, without there being big consequences for them. So um, the way, you know, so that again, if we see that we can be effective and bring about the things that we want. We organize ourselves differently. We go forward, we, we ask for things. We um, look at ambiguous information through um, um, a lens that would tell us we're making some progress, right? You know, so um, think of an example for you, but I can't, but, um, if you think that you're not, you know, you do something, something happens. Now, were you successful or not? It depends on how you understand that, mm. right? So if I say, I am funny, I can make Joseph laugh. Okay, so now you just smiled. So if I'm doing this law of attraction, whatever that means, I see that as my hadn't been successful. Right. right. But if I see that there's no way I'm not at all funny, there's no way I could affect Joseph, then a little smile is not a laugh. Mm. Okay, so the same thing I can see as success or failure on my part. And so the more you believe that you can bring it about, the more likely you are to, uh, in this way that I've just described, provide some of the motivation to go forward. Amazing, amazing. And I think that was an extremely comprehensive um, answer. I would love to ask you kind of the last two questions we always sign off with is you have a, uh, for the people watching on YouTube, you have a vast bookshelf behind you that I'm like in the look, the look of what books have impacted your life the most? Oh, Jay, you know, um, it's very funny because um I'm going to answer by analogy. It's going to take a while to get Please. there. Okay. Okay. Um, so when my niece was applying for uh, to Harvard, that's when I learned that they had to write an essay. Who do you admire? And she called me up and she said, "You know, Aunt Ellie, you know, I, I don't, I don't know who I admire." <laughs> and I said, "Okay, have enough self-respect to know that if you don't admire anybody more than anybody else." then that's probably okay. Um, there's a good reason behind that and use that as your answer rather than make believe you've always admired, I don't know, Sister Ther Mother Teresa or <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt or whatever. And in the same way, you know, that when I'm reading something, I become totally engaged. And, <clears throat> and even if I'm reading something and I don't like it, then that leads to a different set of thoughts. And so um, I, I don't have uh, favorites among, you know, almost anything. I mean, I can make believe green is my favorite color and um, I don't know, lobster is my favorite, you know, um, dinner and champagne is my favorite drink, but it's all made up that um, I, I tend, um, though it might sound sappy, to enjoy whatever I'm doing when I'm doing it. And, you know, that um, if you sort of imagine that uh, at any moment you're like a glass, uh, and the glass is full of water or is full, it can't be more full. 
-hmm. You know, so if the experience, if you're making the moment matter, it matters. And then it doesn't matter to me how I made the moment matter, whether I'm reading something, some heavy nonfiction, or even I'm beginning that physics books now that I'm going to try to get that Nobel Prize in physics. Um, you know, if I'm watching something silly on TV, I enjoy it as much as if I'm watching something uh, heavy and um, that has been applauded by other people. So in other words, it's not, <clears throat> it's not the stimulus, it's what you bring to it, that you can take anything and uh, become engaged in it. And then when you're engaged, you're engaged. It's sort of zero one. Wow, that was a long way of saying, I don't know the answer to that question you asked me. <laughs> but it was a good way to get there. Okay. <laughs> um, the last question that we always sign off with is, what makes a life worth living? Oh, well, you know, for me, that's a, a simple question. I've already answered it. You know, that if you're going to be doing something, show up for it. You know, that uh, I don't think that you should be brushing your teeth thinking about the paper you're going to write or the, you know, the date you're going to have. I think you should be there. And since for me, everything can be fun, um, there's no reason not to be there. So let me give an example. There's this wonderful video that people should watch. It's called Piano Stairs. And what these people did was they show, I, I think it was in Stockholm, I'm not sure where, but they've done it in several places where you go down to the subway station and you have stairs to go back up um, outside. And then you have a, an elevator, uh, an escalator rather, and everybody takes the escalator. Now what they did was lay down piano stairs. Uh, so when you step on the stair, do, 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 it actually makes noise. And it was great fun. And in a very short time, everybody goes from using the escalator to using the stairs. Now, um, what I teach my students is that why wait for somebody else to put this, the piano stairs? You know, I, I do, do, do as I'm going up the stairs uh, regardless. And so the point is that uh, and it, it all follows from each of the things that I'm saying. It, it's hard to do, you know, a, a life lesson in 45 minutes, but that when you recognize that being mindful, actively uh, drawing these distinctions is and, and literally and figuratively enlivening, and that things that are negative are only negative if you see them as negative, you know, so there's a, a way all of it means that you don't have to wait till something pulls you to become engaged or interesting. You can engage it. You don't have to accept that this task you're doing um, is necessarily odious. Mm. Uh, or if you can't get out of that, then you don't have to accept that you have to do it. Mm. Uh, there are many ways for each of us uh, to be successful. And um, uh, so my, my simple answer that I've made very complicated is don't be afraid of uncertainty. Um, it's not that you don't know, but other people know. Nobody knows. And finding that is what's great fun. So be mindful. This person, journalist, called me once. And because there are always these people out there when something is good, they want to know why it's bad or what have you. And so um, she asked me, well, is mindfulness just a fad? And I said, um, no, that if you always burn your toast, every morning you make toast and you burn it, and someone shows you, all you have to do is turn the switch down a slight bit, and then you never burn it again. Unless you like burned toast, why would you ever um, burn the toast again? And so when people recognize that this very simple process, just noticing and the neurons are firing, it turns out again that it's literally and figuratively enlivening. It feels good, it's good for you. Not only that, but when you're mindful, people um, see you as more charismatic and more attractive. You know, we know when someone's not there. You know, have you ever, I don't know where your part of the world 
if you have the expression, the lights on, but nobody's home. Sure, sure. Okay. So um, when you're home, people know it and it's appealing. Uh, you're more trustworthy uh, as far as they're concerned, charismatic. Not only that, but when you're mindful, and each of these things I'm saying, I have a lot of research to back up if, if that's necessary. But the uh, last thing is that when you're mindful, the things that you produce tend to bear the imprint of that mindfulness. So they're just better. So you're better, you're literally healthier, uh, you're happier, people are going to find you more appealing, and what you do is going to um, be at a higher standard. So I can see no reason why anybody, once they understand this, wouldn't then um, just become as mindful as they possibly could. Where can these guys connect with you and where would you like them to check out? Um, I don't know. I guess, you know, my website, ellenlanger.com. Everything that we've discussed today, all the, the papers, the, uh, the, um, your website, I believe I saw you on Twitter. Yeah, um, I my students do that for me. Oh, your students do. You. <laughs> I say, oh, maybe people want to hear this, so put it out there wherever they put it. I think it's on Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, you know. But yeah, um, we'll we'll link to them all. We'll link to them link, all. Link to them all, and you know, I mean, people can just type in my name, and and enough will come up. Um, to uh, satisfy probably fantastic and uh, yeah this has been such a privilege i've been looking forward to this i mean your, your contribution to the field of psychology has been uh you know immense and uh, it's been a a true privilege for me so thank you so much for for taking the time to come on my pleasure joseph you stay well <laughs>